Hey everybody, Blake T. Wild here, and welcome back to another episode of the Comic Shtick Podcast, the podcast where comics are my shtick. This week we got a lot of just weird news to talk about, and Alien Romulus. Uh, I'm very excited to talk more about Alien Romulus, uh, find out what my thoughts were later in the episode. Of course, all of the time marks and codes are in the description below, so check that out if there's anything specific you need to you need to learn about real quick. Um, of course, follow me on Instagram, at NotBlakeWild, and check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash smokiesvideos, where you can read the first two issues of my comic series, The Custodians, Agents of Cross, for as little as $2, and much more on there as well. I will also be attending Tucson Comic Con, August 30th to September 1st, so come by and see me there at booth AA183 in Tucson, Arizona, August 30th to September 1st, 2024. Stop on by, say hi. And you can also listen to the Comic Stick Podcast on Spotify, uh, the other podcast places. <laughs> Not Apple, though, because it's a pain in the ass to set up, and I hate Apple. Hey, do you remember when I used to talk about comic books on this show? Well, do I have some news for you, because DC Comics is doing this new thing <laughs> called DC All In. I have no idea what that's about. Seemingly, it's running concurrently with um, Absolute DC, DC Comics' answer to Marvel Ultimate Universe, uh, but this is another thing. This is completely unrelated. DC All In. There is going to be a new Rene Montoya The Question series. Rene Montoya became The Question, I think, in New 52 and into Rebirth. I just realized I had my energy drink right next to the microphone. <laughs> Fuck. So if you heard any little crackling and popping, it was the little bubbles inside of that. Uh, anyway, Rene Montoya, she became The Question after Vic Sage... Something happened to him, and she became the question for a while after she stopped being a police officer, and everybody loves her as the question. I actually haven't read anything question-related, um, although I do think I have a question series around here somewhere that I bought, like, complete. I just have no idea where it is. I don't know. This is a cool idea. You know, Renee Montoya is the question. She has been the question. Possibly... As long, if not longer, than she has been a character in the DC Universe. I honestly don't know when Renee Montoya was created. Was she created for the TV show? The animated series in the 90s? It's possible. I don't know. What is the correlation between Renee Montoya being created and then Renee Montoya post-questionization? Anyway, this is a new series called The Question All Along the Watchtower uh, from Alex Segura and Cyan Tormi coming out this November. And the All Along the Watchtower thing, I think it has something to do with the return of the Justice League. But it's also, there's like a murder mystery Justice League thing going on. Can you tell I'm not keeping up with modern comics? Um, the other DC All In, or whatever, is Batgirl. A new Batgirl series is also releasing this November, written by Tate Bromble and illustrated by Takashi Miyazawa. Uh, it is... What is her name? Who is it? Is it Cass? Is it? No. Or is it Stephanie Brown? I think it's Cass. Is Cassandra whatever her last name is? She's the one that has the full face mask that doesn't have like the mouth opening or whatever like all the other bad family costumes do i'm pretty sure it's her the blonde one although are both stephanie and her blonde i don't fucking remember <laughs> that's another character i just really never read anything from my favorite bad girl is barbara gordon basic uh, my favorite robin is carrie kelly fuck you if you disagree <laughs> but that's neat. Everybody's really excited for this Batgirl series because fucking they haven't been real characters since those late 90s into the mid 2000s. 
Uh, I don't know what event it would have been that stopped their existence, but it was somewhere in the early 2000s. Maybe Final Crisis, and then New 50, or then the 52. Am I getting my dates mixed up? I don't remember. But something happened, and that character hasn't been around anymore. <laughs> God almighty, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that is why I'm going to move on to something I also don't know what I'm talking about, but is funnier. The Crow's Nest segment. Ka-ka! This is a somewhat weekly segment on the podcast called The Crow's Nest, where I go and discuss news related to The Crow. <laughs> The 2024 film, which I think is coming out the day that this episode is released. I honestly don't know. Because I'm not going to see it. Because I, I bring this up every time I do a Crow's Nest segment, which for some reason I've just decided to become a staple of the series. I don't care about The Crow. I've never watched any of The Crow films, of which there's a handful apparently never read any of the crow comics i'm sure there's like a video game about the crow because there's definitely something video game related in this segment but i just could not care less about the crow but for some reason i've decided to make it a segment in the show uh so crow's nest uh first bit of news is there's like a cgi marketing campaign where (laughs) i don't know if it's like an augmented reality thing you can view on your phone or if it's just a video, but they they crow-ized the Statue of Liberty. Like, they, they, they gave her the crow makeup, and they CGI'd a bunch of, like, a, a murder of crows around her head, <laughs> just flying around the Statue of Liberty as a, just a marketing gimmick for the campaign for the film. The other in even crazier than that, because, you know, you're a marketing team. You're like, how can we advertise the crow? The Statue of Liberty, of course. You got that guy on one end of the uh, sort of meeting room. And then on the opposite end of the table, you have the guy who's like, let's get Call of Duty into this. (laughs) Because you can now get the official crow skin or, like, character in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 and Warzone. (laughs) What the fuck? Why? Why Call of Duty? Could they not, like, afford to... Do they pay Fortnite? They must. They would have to. Like... To pay Fortnite to, like, or just, like, Fortnite, I don't know how. It's some sort of symbiotic relationship that Fortnite has formed with the cinema industry. (laughs) In that they license out these characters and all this extra stuff, but they're both places are, like, making money off of it? So, like... How does that work? Has anybody ever discussed how, how the fuck Fortnite keeps getting these licenses? Is, like... What are they paying? And then what are they, are they getting paid in return? Something? How does that work? But anyway, it doesn't matter because where you expect the crow to be advertised in a video game is Fortnite. Instead, it is in Call of Duty, and it is Bill Skarsgård's 3D modeled face, and he's running around a Call of Duty map, and he has a hatchet in his hand or something, and the, the, the trailer for it is making it out to be this crazy, epic, dark thing. It's like, get vengeance on the wicked or some shit like that, and it's it's fucking the, the new crow in Call of Duty. Why? And speaking of bird-related news, I suppose. Chick-fil-A has announced that they are going to be concocting their own streaming service. It's seemingly primarily going to be horrible reality television marketed to uh, what I would imagine is a heavily Christian audience. Or they're going to try and do the uh, how do you do fellow kids you know that kind of uh, uh, arrangement but i foresee knowing the company chick-fil-a the way i do i foresee them going horribly knock off hallmark movies 
uh, terrible reality television about a husband and a wife who have had way too many children. Um, what other, uh, probably some sort of like office inspired reality show about working at a Chick-fil-A in a popular city. What other stupid fucking television shows could Chick-fil-A produce on the cheap and then put into these probably terrible like pseudo documentaries or like some sort of uh, history of the company uh, stuff that says gay people are bad. <laughs> uh, let's see. What if they close the streaming service down on Sunday? <laughs> you just can't log in onto the onto the Chick Fil A streaming service every Sunday. You're you're locked out. <laughs> Tells you to go pray. Um, that's insane. That is absolute insanity that Chick-fil-A is creating a streaming service. It's it's like it's it's another step closer to like the ultra parody of idiocracy. Oh man. Moving on to some uh, good news. CGC, the company that grades comics based on a scale that they created all on their own, have lost a 10 million dollar lawsuit. So, this lawsuit uh, was in part due to, uh, it was via this husband and wife team who work on restoring and like just the complete restoration of old comic books, which is, I saw a couple of clips of what they do. It's fucking insane because they're going through like a, a old issue, like amazing, uh, fan, famous, fucking, <laughs> God damn, uh, f fantasy 15 <laughs> whatever fuck spider-man's first appearance and like they have it's super microscopic scale and they're going through and re-inking dot per dot and the like the ben day dots from the actual printing how it's printed with you know the little dots if you're unfamiliar to create the larger picture they're going through and re-inking each and every one of those they're redoing like the wording and whitening up the like uh, the word balloons and shit it's insane detail that they're working on but from what i've read and then learned from internet discourse and the article um the guy in, who's head of CGC something Nelson, I can't remember his name, who gives a shit, he said that restoring a comic will improve its grade or value. That did not happen. They, did, they didn't They did grade it. They um, said that the work that this couple was doing were improperly restored and the value was actually lowered. So this buyer who bought an older comic and sent it to this couple to have it properly restored by these like professional grade people uh paid twenty four thousand dollars to do it uh the head of the cgc guy nelson said that it definitely wasn't worth that price and they ruined the book and the buyer demanded three thousand dollars back which is surprising that it was that little so then, uh, you know, word spread that this couple wasn't to be trusted. And according to the, uh, <laughs> the, the articles, uh, Nelson from CGC spread rumors about the couple to places like Heritage Auctions and other CGC forums and buyers and, uh, you know, related companies, I suppose, which just fucked this couple up. This has apparently been going on for several years now. And I am so fucking glad that it is one step closer to the CGC going to fucking hell. I hate c grading comics. I hate the CGC. I've talked about it before. It is stupid. It is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Sure, you know, these comics are art. As you can see in the video version, I have uh, Al Ewing's Ant-Man series from a couple years ago, as well as some Kate Bishop Hawkeye comics framed on my wall. Those are like five to ten dollar little frames that I got from Walmart. It serves the exact same purpose. And if I want, I could whip up a nicely designed little thing on uh, Adobe InDesign or something that says, graded by the BTW company, 9.9, .9, because, you know, I'll be realistic here. <laughs> and just fucking slap it, tape it on the fucking glass. 
I hate CGC. It's the worst. It is the collector market 2.0, the speculator market 2.0 from the 90s that caused the downfall of comic books. Just reiterated into this stupid fucking plastic coffins for these books that you're supposed to read. I don't understand the enjoyment. I There's another company that does something similar to CGC, except you can actually open the book out if you want it to, but it's like, it's the slightly thinner plastic cases. They don't grade it. It's just like, they look good when you hang them on the wall. I, I, I just don't get the obsession with it. And it fucking ruins comic book collecting because now you got all these motherfuckers at conventions who have books that are way overpriced to begin with because again we're in the speculator market 2.0 thanks to all the comic book films oh what if it's the first appearance of the riddly diddler or the calamity jane and crew (laughs) This issue from the 60s that would have been worth maybe a dollar is now being sold for $10 because it might be the first appearance of the next big character. You got those, and then usually at the same kind of of booths at these conventions, you got the fucking wall of CGC slabs. And I know there's another company that also does the slabbing. Uh, I can't remember their name. I hate them too. It makes no sense why everybody has become obsessed with it. And like I said at the beginning of my tirade against the CGC, you're sending the... You have to... Here's how it works. You have to pay first to send it in. Then you got to pay more to like get it looked at and and graded and all of this and, sh- and slabbed and shipped back and all this extra expertise quote-unquote it's made up it's all made up before the cgc guess what they (laughs) no one had a system like that there wasn't just a system that the cgc adopted they created this they created their own system that everybody just kind of agrees works it's like a fiat currency why (laughs) it's so ridiculous that you're just listening Even more so is the fact that it's not like when I think of the CGC, I don't think of like, oh, yeah, they're just collectors at heart. You know, it's a very wizards, uh, wizard magazine system and company. Um, It's it's just it's a company that's out to make money. So, of course, they're going to do stuff to get you to come back. Of course, they're going to do things like, oh, well, this is a lower grade, but hey, if you ever, you know, get another one, make sure you send it right on back and we can adjust this accordingly and this and that and blah, 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 all in this system that they made up. I fucking hate it. (laughs) I despise it. One year I was at a convention. I got John Romita Jr.'s autograph on two issues of the Annocenti Daredevil series. The first appearance of Typhoid Mary, the best Daredevil villain that's ever been created. I love her. And the first appearance of Blackheart. Now, I got it autographed on the first page, underneath the big splash panel of the first page, not on the cover. But everybody else was doing the covers because John Romita Jr.'s booth was right here. And then to his right was like an inker, I think it might have been Danny Mickey or somebody, whoever he was working on the new Spider-Man series with at that time, like when it first started, it was around when this was. And then the third booth down, all connected as one giant conveyor belt, it was John Romita Jr., the inker, CGC. So you can go straight on down and get your little certificate that says that you definitely got this autograph by John Romita Jr. and that inker guy. And if you want, you can pay a little extra to send it off to the CGC warehouse where it will be enslabbed in a block of plastic for all of eternity. Good thing it's made out of plastic because when the earth dies and humanity is long gone, whatever comes after will be able to crack open those comics if they have a screwdriver and a hammer handy. Fucking ridiculous. (laughs) Thus ends my tirade against the CGC. Moving on to uh, some more depressing news, I suppose. Uh, So, uh, a couple months ago, X-Men 97 was released. Probably around the beginning of the year, honestly. I don't remember when that was. Then, a couple months after that... Uh, Bo DeMeo, or as I called him, Bowl of Mayo, 
because <laughs> it's just a ridiculous sounding name. Uh, Bowl of Mayo was fired by Disney and nobody knew why. People said it was for his OnlyFans account, which didn't make any sense. Um, they also said it was for sharing a gay fan art illustration or something, which was just ridiculous to begin with. Um, now it has come out that he allegedly sent nude photos of himself in sexually suggestive hero poses to several young male staffers working on X-Men 97, saying that they could be used as quote-unquote inspiration. Uh, Bowl of Mayo, after the Disney firing, uh, word was coming out that uh, he was not a good person to work with. I think it was on the Witcher series or some other Netflix show. Uh, there was issues there as well. And assuming that this does continue and this is legitimate, which it kind of seems like, um, how fucking rancid of a person is that, that he attempted to trick the public into being on his side by like playing the gay card, <laughs> you know, if he's fucking doing this shit, that is just horrible. It's disgusting abuse of power. Again, why does that keep happening in uh, uh, these uh, sort of uh, uh, industries where, like, how, what did he get away with <laughs> to begin with? And the worst part are all the defenders of it. I, I'm not surprised that there are. There's defenders of, like, Jonathan Majors and shit. But the defense of Bowl of Mayo, <laughs> Bo de Mayo, is... Like, uh, there's a fair amount I've seen, especially on Twitter. The defense is like, oh, well, he created X-Men 97. So he's okay in my book. Like, it's just that it's that corrupted separation of art from the artist, I think, is a good way to describe it. Where it's like, oh, well, I don't care if he's a sexual predator as long as they keep letting him make cool TV for me to watch. Uh, it's, I suppose, good to uh, finally have this legal case work through? I don't know. He also allegedly groped an assistant multiple times and was said to be emotionally and physically abusive to the staffers. Um, I'm sure there's also the proponents of uh, the defense online that are like, oh, well, what does it mean to be emotionally abusive? <laughs> uh, being a terrible person <laughs> is what that means. I would, uh, I'm interested to know what, like, physical abuse he was committing to these people, like, slapping them and shit, or something, like, hitting them, like, what the fuck, like, throwing stuff at him. It, it seems kind of like it's almost like a very angry sort of, uh, kind of person, especially with, like, the Twitter messaging that he's suddenly come up with in an uproar. Uh, it, it's very vitriolic. Now that this stuff is coming out. And again, the fact that, uh, you know, continuing this thought of this is what he was doing. The fact that he did try to sway public opinion by just going on a crusade that he got fired because he's openly gay and a black man. That's fucked up. <laughs> because that does happen. And when it something like this happens and it's like not the reason then that can just be used as an excuse by racists and bigots to be like oh well here we go again but uh, i'm sure that more is going to come out about that eventually uh, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below but i'm sure more is going to come out about this uh, depressing situation of uh, hollywood Moving on to another depressing situation coming straight out of the gates of Hollywood. Zack Snyder's new movie got a trailer called Twilight of the Gods, and it's releasing on Netflix September 19th. Just last week, I made the announcement and discussed the fact that his zombie universe is dead. He still has Star Wars, but they say fuck. And now he has this, which it doesn't look poorly animated, but it looks very immature and very stupid. And as soon as I saw the title, my first thoughts were, oh, God, Zack Snyder is going to ruin Norse mythology now. 
because if you're unfamiliar, Twilight of the Gods is Ragnarok, uh, the end-all, be-all, uh, climactic tale within Norse mythology where just about all the gods die except for like a handful of them. Thor's sons hang out. Uh, the first like man and woman are safe in a cave, blah, blah, blah. And then like life continues on after this. Oh my god, this fucking trailer looks so stupid. <laughs> so awful and it looks like it's going to be highly popular with the high school uh, teenage boys and guys who never grew out of that phase of their lives it just the trailer alone oh my god it's like the word violence appears on the screen and then it cuts like boo 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 like action beats and then it says sex <laughs> and then it cuts to like you know, people having sex and like a woman, like POV shot of this cartoon animated woman riding someone. <laughs> and then it cuts to something. Uh, I can't remember what the third word is. I just, I couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. I was, wasn't paying attention. I was just like, oh my God, what is this? It looks like a parody. <laughs> oh God. I just, I can't wait to see that three and a half hour long shitty product. Netflix really fucking just attached their horse to a... Attach their horse? Really attached their wagon to a horse that has diarrhea, didn't they? <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, Sony is not expected to renew their contract with Phil Lord and Christopher Miller. Geniuses behind Into the Spider-Verse. Solo. <laughs> Until they were released from the project and Ron Howard came on to make it a bit more in line with what Star Wars is, I suppose. And the other two Spider-Verse uh, shows. The studio and the duo apparently were enduring a heated fight over the budget of the Spider-Man Noir series. And that has led to a... Um to a to a split between them. So, uh, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, I don't know if they're going to continue to work on the spider noir show or what or if like if they're done completely after the third spider verse movie because apparently they were also set to reboot spider-man for television god fucking damn it sony you morons <laughs> god why <laughs> you could have gotten the guys who did Spider-Verse to make a Spider-Man TV show, not just one, but two, and you let them go because you didn't want to pay for it? God almighty, you're so fucking stupid. Instead, you're going and wasting money on Craven <laughs> and whatever other fucking Spider-Man movies you have coming that don't have Spider-Man in them. You really think people are going to go see Sinister Six with Morbius? <laughs> God damn it, Sony. You ruined another one. <sighs> Elsewhere in the animation department, Joker 2 is apparently going to begin with a Looney Tunes-inspired cartoon starring the Joker. Uh, so that's fun. <laughs> it's going to go from that to a, 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 a depressing Ha Ha Land musical. All right, now I got a couple of movie, re more movie-related stuff, uh, specifically trailers, because when I went to go see Romulus, I saw two new trailers that I've never seen before. The first is Nosferatu by Robert Eggers, one of my favorite directors out currently. I absolutely love The Witch, or the VV Itch, as I should say, uh, with my celebrity crush Anya Taylor-Joy, and I fucking loved The Lighthouse. It was my favorite film of... 2019? 2018. When did The Lighthouse come out? Don't recall. But it was my favorite film of the year. Robert Pattinson, Willem Dafoe. Oh my god. But now he is redoing Nosferatu. I love... The original Nosferatu is good. You know, it's obviously a movie from the 30s. So it's a silent film. You can find it online. People add music to it and shit. Uh, it's a good movie. I prefer... Uh, Nosferatu the Vampire by Werner Herzog. That is an incredible film. It is a dark film. It is a off-putting film. Uh, a lot of rats died, if I recall correctly, <laughs> in the making of that movie. 
And uh, this one is, oh my god, it's Robert Eggers in his most Robert Eggersy. And I love how long it takes him to make films because he really works hard on getting every little microscopic detail correct. It is just such a splendor when he comes out with new movies. And now it is Nosferatu. I cannot wait. With something that happened when um, The Lighthouse came out, I can't remember what it was. I was going to make a video about it, but I never did. The files are still sitting on my computer. Every fucking interview about the lighthouse had the people asking Robert Eggers the same question and you could watch like you could tell when he was being asked these questions because as they go on like in each one he just gets more and more visibly annoyed when the same fucking question pops up <laughs> and it's always the stupidest fucking thing too <laughs> so I can't wait for that to happen again uh, but Nosferatu, oh my god, it looks incredible. Willem Dafoe is in it. Um, is Anya Taylor-Joy in this one? I can't remember. Oh yeah, The Northman. I almost forgot about The Northman. Uh, she's in that. That's a great film too. I love Anya Taylor-Joy. Uh, what else? I'm honestly blanking on who all is in this film. I remember hearing about it, but I don't recall. But oh my god, it looks perfect. Highly recommend Every Robert Eggers film. Let's have a, a, a marathon. <laughs> Maybe I'll watch the Robert Eggers cinematic experience uh, before the uh, Nosferatu film comes out later this year. But the other trailer that I saw, for some reason, because if I don't know if you're familiar with how uh, theaters typically work <laughs> in this modern age, but when you go see an R-rated film, Usually, the trailers are of other R-rated films, right? It makes sense, because they're not going to show a fucking trailer for Alien Romulus before the Minions. Although they did show an Alien Romulus trailer before Deadpool and Wolverine, which of course is an R-rated movie, but the amount of children in that theater was ridiculous, and I hope they got terrified by that trailer. Anyway. <laughs> I can't believe this. So, you know, it's like R-rated movies, whatever, like, the new adult films are coming out. Not as porn, you know. <laughs> but I'm sitting there, and I'm on my phone, because I've already seen these trailers. And I see the Nosferatu one. I'm like, holy shit, that looks fucking amazing. And then there was another trailer that I didn't pay attention to. <laughs> and then... <laughs> The trailer for Mufasa comes on right before Alien Romulus starts to play. <laughs> what the fuck is that? First of all, why was why did Mufasa's trailer play <laughs> in front of Alien Romulus? And second, who was asking for this movie? Who was asking for Lion King 0.5? I suppose we already got Lion King 1, 2, 1.5. Now we gotta get 0.5. Because this, if you're unfamiliar, is a prequel about Mufasa's upbringing and how he became the king of the lions. And also, these motherfuckers apparently made Mufasa's brother a white albino lion? Like, you know... Kimba the White Lion, the one that everybody says Disney stole the idea for The Lion King from, that Japanese animation film from the 80s, maybe? Why did they make his brother, like, uh, like a white lion or something? And th even more confusing is that later in this trailer, more white lions start showing up. What's with these, like, white lions? Where are they coming from? Like, Mufasa gets encircled by him or something, and it kind of looks like it's just literally the Lion King, um, thing, story. Although, I think Mufasa's apparently an ad adopted or something, which is not how lions work, by the way. <laughs> For the most part, I if I remember correctly from all those nature documentaries I watched when I was a child. Um, yeah, I was one of those kids. <laughs> I think it's like Mufasa and his like albino brother <laughs> grow up together and he turns evil and takes over like Scar does later. And then fucking we know what's going to happen. This isn't like Andor where we know what happens to him and we're excited to see his journey. Who gives a shit about Mufasa? Especially Mufasa in the live, well not live action, the the realistic 
version of The Lion King by Jonathan Favreau. Just what the fuck is this? Is this going to make money? Did the, I assume the last one did, because why would they make this if it didn't? Uh, now, whisking back my mind to the past, I 100% remember the live-action, quote-unquote, that everybody called it, Lion King movie making bank. Just disgusting. <laughs> I, hope the, uh, I hope the Lilo and Stitch movie makes a lot of money. That one deserves it, I feel. <laughs> Having knowing nothing about what this live action version is going to be like, that's the one that deserves it. I mean, come on, honestly, you're going to go fucking see Snow White or you're going to see Lilo and Stitch, an actual good story about family and Ohana, which means family. Okay, <laughs> ending my, uh, this is a very angry episode, isn't it? <laughs> ending that, moving on, finally we get to Alien Romulus. Alien Romulus, the climactic return to form for the Alien franchise. Uh, let me start off the bat by saying there are going to be spoilers. I'm just going to go straight in. I have a, my list of notes on my phone right here. Like I always do in all of my movie reviews, I'm just going to go down that list, baby. Um, first of all, it is just a beautiful atmosphere. Fede Alvarez and the writer... Uh, whose name I might have in here somewhere. Uh, Rodo Saya. Rodo Saga. Fuck me. Sayagas. Rodo Sayagas, I assume. Um, I feel that they did. I don't remember if Rodo worked on Evil Dead. I don't think he did. But Fede Alvarez directed the Evil Dead 2013 film, a film I notoriously hate, and everybody disagrees with me. <laughs> Whenever I bring it up, you can find... A, I did a video about all the Sam Raimi and the Evil Dead 2013 film uh, sometime before Multiverse of Madness came out. So if you want to hear my thoughts on that, check it out. But I think that he just did a far better job on his outing into the Alien universe than he did into the Evil Dead universe. Because with the Evil Dead film, it kind of just became like a normal horror film. Whereas this really had that vibrant anxiety and stress levels that you are come to expect from an alien story um at least like the first two and then the video game i suppose because those are the ones that everybody really thinks of uh you know the, the you're on the run from a fucking giant xenomorph that's hunting you down it was fantastic um, I, I, I loved it. I uh, adored this film. I want to go see it again. I had such a great time with it. I felt tense and just horrified the whole time, especially I love how long the buildup is. It's just so well done in my mind that I, I loved it. <laughs> That's all I can really say is I had a great time with this film. I got to sit in my favorite spot in the theater, which is four rows from the screen. And that was an experience that was so great because when you're that close, the sound system engulfs you. All your vision is just the movie. So you, you're like, it's like you're wearing blinders. It's like you're watching this. And I don't know if anybody else experiences this, but whenever I watch a film in the cinema, uh, there's a certain point where my brain just kind of clicks and it kind of is tricked <laughs> into seeing what's happening as like real people, like a giant person up on the screen instead of just a film. It's actually like a, a real person who's experiencing these things. And it just makes the film so much better for me once I reach that sort of uh, nirvanic level <laughs> of theater going. And that's what happened here as well. Oh my god, the beautiful atmosphere, beautifully designed sets, just loved the shitty ramshackle technology. I love Jackson's star and the way you world building that is established. I, I also can't believe, is this the first time that they've shortened Waylon Utani? <laughs> By the way, like I really like Wei Yu, and I'm surprised I've never heard or read that before. Um, I like the establishment that uh, there's non Waylon Utani space as well. Like, they don't control everything, they just control a majority of it. Um, it's just such a shitty world, and the technology, like I said, I love. The <laughs> 
Speaking of the world building and the tech, those fucking trucks that are just driving around the planet and the colony with the giant wheels and like the little teeny cabin, those fucking things look so stupid. <laughs> I love them. Uh, I also love that they're, um, the shuttle that the group goes up to the station in. I like that it has windshield wipers that are just like regular windshield wipers of a car. <laughs> Something so ridiculous about that scene where they're exiting orbit and like the storm clouds are like rocking the ship and like the warning sirens are going off and the pilot Navarro, she's like holding everything steady <laughs> and she's just, just fucking wiping off the raid with just regular mundane fucking windshield wipers. I mean, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I'm sure that they make some like heat drying sort of like vents on, on, on the more expensive ships of course but that was just I really love that uh, starting it off though oh my god the way that they play with and used the silence of space holy shit that was incredible I loved the utter silence, aside from the fact that during the intro where the uh, ship is coming and finds the Nostromo wreckage, uh, there was a guy like a couple rows behind me shuffling into his seat. <laughs> so that kind of hampered the experience a little bit. But, oh my gosh, every other time, and then when they cut to space and it's super muted what you're hearing, just so clever and well done, really, oh, you, nobody hears you in space, no one hears you scream. The... Uh, exact same feeling for the uh the use of gravity or lack thereof oh my god I, I was getting so tense just when they were entering the ship and they uh are like floating through that giant room and um bjorn the cousin guy he's like uh, just above a giant chasm <laughs> floating there and the other two are like holding onto the rails i'm like oh my god dude why are you doing that just even that got my stomach upset and tense as just this build-up of like oh god fucking when is something bad gonna happen to these poor people <laughs> i love that build-up that was such a well-done build uh towards just things going more and more wrong and, oh my god, the camera, how it, the camera would continue after the characters would stop moving. Fuck me, man. I was getting vertigo in the theater. It was so just disorienting. Um, I loved how they also played with, like, not keeping the ship just stationary. Like, you know, it's like a car or a boat or something in space. They actually show it, like, maneuvering and working in three dimensions uh, when, when it's uh, flying up to the space station. Okay, here's a question for you, the audience. What the fuck is that organic meteor thing that they harvest the xenomorph from? Like, what the fuck was that? Has that ever been established as something before? I, I, have people talked about this and figured something out? I, I don't understand that at all. That was something that really confused me. Um, I, I just, I, I want to know what that is. That organic cocoon possibly is that what is implying that it, there was going to be another is it another xenomorph cocoon or something what was that and it just got charred maybe um <laughs> i did think that the station was going to be entirely inhabited by synthetics because when they entered the station and they're crawling through that crawl space it says synthetics only on the outside and it's like oh shit that's an interesting premise the space stations only has synthetic beings on it Neat. Does that mean that they'll still be around? No, that is apparently the synthetic maintenance hatch or something, which just shows how, like, this movie does a great job in showing just how much of a disregard humanity has for the synthetics. Um, because, like, they're making them crawl through these fucking tight little corridors for some reason. Like, that's so weird. Like, it's like a, like a waiter, uh, like the butler shaft or something. Uh, the rain and die. <laughs> the Rain and Andy dynamics were uh, very lovely and fantastic. It, it really did. I wasn't sure where they were going with it at first. And I love the reveal that he is a synthetic. And oh my god, how fucking good is Dave Johnson, the guy who plays Andy? 
fantastic actor. So well done in how he portrays the two different versions of Andy throughout the film. And I was so worried that this was going to end with another synthetic is evil plot line, which it kind of did in a way, but not to the extent that like Prometheus and Covenant and the other one did. Um, was there another one like that? I guess not, now that I think about it. It's mostly those two that just left a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, fantastic. He and Kaylee Spaney uh, were incredible. She is a badass, fantastic lead character. Did a great job. Has come a long way from Pacific Rim 2. <laughs> I, I love the whole group. It were my favorites. I just, I really enjoyed everybody and the dynamics that they had between them. Uh, the first quarter or like third or half of the movie, I guess the first 30 minutes, the first half of the movie, once, like until they get to the space station. And even after that, it really did feel to me like, like Attack the Block meets Aliens. Because they all have such a, like almost all of them have such a thick, like inner city London sort of accent. <laughs> It just reminded me of the fantastic film Attack the Block, which I highly recommend you check it out. It has John Boyega, it has Jodie Whittaker, it has Nick Frost. A great film. Also has to do with a group of teenagers and young people uh, being trapped in one place as horrible black aliens try to kill them. Um, very well done. The, all the characters, aside from like Bjorn, who you're meant to not like... Uh, also, apparently, the director came out and confirmed that Isabella Mersad, who I did not realize was her until the very end of the film, where they're escaping on the shuttle. I'm like, where did Isabella, what's her name, come in at? Where is she? I didn't even see her. For some reason, her curly hair <laughs> in this movie just really threw me off. Um, the director confirmed that the baby she is carrying is from Bjorn, her cousin, which I suppose isn't surprising. Because that colony doesn't seem that big. It was really neat to see uh, this younger cast of characters and how these just like young, late teens, early 20s, people would react to a situation like this. Like they're just scrounging for their life on Jackson's star. They've never done anything like this. Although Tyler, <laughs> who just has such the weirdest normal name, um, there's like something going on with him where he knows all this stuff about weapons and the Marines and all of that and the colonial Marines. He says it's attributed to like reading like military manuals and magazines and stuff. But I don't know if I believe that there's something more mysterious about his past. I feel, uh, he, he definitely is the most sort of, uh, active and knowledgeable of the group. Uh, that was another thing I loved. For some reason, I just really like seeing people use mechanisms and, like, big, like, pieces of machinery, like, ch -ch 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 -ch, like, when they're breaking into the ship and they're having to press all these buttons and do this and that and open up this and close down that. I don't know. There's just something so much fun about that that I really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, the whole cast. Fantastic. I do have mixed feelings about how much it turned into the first alien at the end and the weird hybrid, which is very reminiscent of Alien Cubed. Alien Resurrection. Is that the third one? Yeah. That was insane. Um, it worked very well in my mind, I feel. I think, like, I was heavy, I was apprehensive about it when I realized what was happening. Like, I thought the film was going to end with them escaping, and then it kept going on, and then I was like, okay, they're doing the ending of the first Alien. And then, uh, what's-her-name has the baby egg, and it just gets worse and worse, and it just gets horrifying, and... Then it's the horrible offspring hybrid creature that looks like the engineers from Prometheus and Covenant. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. It's not, I didn't think it was as bad as Resurrection. Again, I preferred, I prefer this one 100% to what happens in that movie, the Resurrection film. Uh, it, it did win me over. Obviously, it won me over because, um, you know, I, it did enough. It, new stuff and more interesting premise with the ideas than if it was just a carbon copy of like the first ending of the first alien. 
Uh, I, I do think it worked well. And I did actually enjoy how they built upon Prometheus and Covenant. I, I like that. I like the whole blue, black goo aspect of it. Ow. Just hit my elbow against the table. And I was surprised that I kind of want to go and rewatch Prometheus and Alien Covenant again now. I think I just want to rewatch the Alien films because this they're such fun films. Even the worst of them are still enjoyable, I think. Uh, they all are cast exquisitely. You can't say that any of the cast members from any of the Alien films are really poorly done. Maybe Winona Ryder, but I love Winona Ryder, so I can't hold that against her. <laughs> But uh, I, I do kind of want to revisit those films and just maybe a chronological viewing of it now that Romulus is out. Because this takes place between the first alien and then the second aliens. Regarding the offspring, um, I do think it would... Something that I would have done differently is they should have had Isabella Mersad tell Rain... Uh, who is, it's spelled R-A-I-N, so gee whiz, I wonder where the person, where her dad was looking when he wrote the name down on the birth certificate. <laughs> so, I think it would have been really cool if she had told Rain, you know, because she reveals to her that she's pregnant, in very early stages of pregnancy. She throws up, she has morning sickness, blah, 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 she's not showing yet. I think it would have been so much better if they had given her a line about, like, I'm thinking about naming the baby this if it's a boy or that if it's a girl. So that way, when the fucking horrific monster shows up at the end, anybody who forgot that she's pregnant, because, like, they don't really bring it up any further after the fact that, like... She gets sick, she lies down, she goes to sleep. Don't bring up the pregnancy, except for maybe when she's at the door and gets hoisted away by the xenomorph. Uh, but even then, I'm sure so many members of the audience just could totally forgot that she's pregnant. I just, I think, I feel like it would have been that much more of a fucking punch to the gut, to the ovary, if you will, if they had named the baby. <laughs> Just something even more fucked up in an already fucked up movie. Like, oh, if if it's a girl, I want to name her Aqua. <laughs> I don't know. If it's a boy, I want to name him Robert. And then she has that fucking monster. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> the humanity. Uh, so let's talk about... Let's, let's talk about the black goo, shall we? So the black goo, as established in Prometheus is something that's, like, created by the engineers, right? And the engineers, if I remember correctly, because it's... <sighs> Whenever Covenant came out, I had rewatched Prometheus somewhat recently before that. So that is the last time I've seen either of those movies. So I'm just basing this off of whatever I can remember. I, If I remember correctly, the engineers created humanity, right? So... I was talking about this to somebody and we were theorizing on it. I think that the black goo, the reason that it, it reacted differently to uh, Isabella Mersad's character than it did to that rat that it blew up <laughs> into a blob is because it probably like connects to some kind of ancient DNA strands that are like left over in the human genome that evolution just pushed off to the side, you know? And they bring up a couple of times once they reach the medical lab just how much DNA similarities a human has with a rat. And then they but then they show that the rat exploded into a blob while the humans the one human that we see get injected does not. And that, bl that blob rat <laughs> happens pretty quickly after, you know, she takes it. Maybe it would have occurred had the offspring creature not, like, sucked the venom out of her body. Which, oh my god, they could have gotten so much worse than what they could have, like, they did. Like, it could have been Evil Dead levels of, like, the fucking 
gross, like, blood, black ooze lactating out of her breasts. That's honestly what I thought were going to be some visuals <laughs> that were going to be occurring. But we didn't really see that too much, thankfully. Though I would have been okay with it. I loved how absolutely disgusting this film was. The visuals were very vaginal in this one. But anyway, my theory about why uh, she didn't burst into a horrible blob like that rat is because it reacted with whatever strands of DNA are still in humanity from the engineer lineage. So there's something going on there that's going to create this sort of counteraction than what you would expect and seen in other experiments with other creatures. Because he engineers didn't make rats. God made rats. <laughs> but um, it's it's probably that that's also my reasoning for why the offspring looks so much like an engineer is because of that aspect of humanity's origins in this universe and my god how fucking scary was that when it appears behind rain at the end and it's like hunched over like this <laughs> god i hated seeing that fucking thing it made me so uncomfortable <laughs> now let's get to the mm, the elephant in the room, if you will, the CGI recreated elephant in the room. And that is Rook, who I could not tell what was going on with him until I looked it up after the film and went to the Wikipedia page and saw how they used Ian Holmes' likeness for the character, and then it just hit me. I'm like, oh, of course. If you're unfamiliar, Ian Holm played Bishop in the original Alien film. He was the synthetic. This is the same model, which I feel was totally just unnecessary, but it's a neat inclusion. And, you know, it's not like they didn't get the rights to use his likeness, like they stole it from him or something, his estate, I suppose. So I'm fine with it. Um, it's, it's a neat inclusion, and you can't really tell because half of his face is fucked up anyway, which I think is a good way to go about that. Um, and they usually show him, like, more cast in shadow or through a horrible quality video screen. So they do attempt to make, uh, like, obfuscations and obscure it a little bit. So it, it works better than it could have. Or, like, it works better than it could have had they not done those things and it just looked weird. But, like, it wasn't... I didn't think it was a great likeness, clearly, because I didn't recognize him. <laughs> but again, I think that's just because his face is half-destroyed. Um, he's, of course, an evil synth. And this also raises the question, going back to the, the rats and the black goo, did he know what would have happened... Like, he would have had to, unless those parts of his mind got destroyed after the alien escaped, maybe. But, like, how did that work? Like, wh were his plans to unleash that virus or something? Or did he really want to get it back to the research center? I would imagine it's the latter. Because I don't think Rook has it in his processing to go as psycho as David did in Prometheus and Covenant. I think they worked out those kinks. But I just, I want to know more about, like, where that's going to lead to now. Uh, well, I guess it doesn't lead anywhere because the the goop, the black goo is either still on the ship with rain or it got sucked out into the vacuum of space where it could as easily just get picked back up again by fucking way, way you. Um, but I, I did like the inclusion of Rook as the villain. Again, it didn't have to be Ian Holm. I'm fine with the fact that they reused his likeness. It, like I said, it just could have eas as easily been a wholly different character. It just, it's another synth. Uh, my final thoughts are that Rain, when she gets the rifle and um, it's the zero G scene with the xenomorphs, and she's just fucking unloading on him. I really like that rifle design as well, and the the aim assist shoulder harness kind of thing. 
it reminded me so much of playing the Alien vs. Predator video game from the like mid 2000s, the one where it has three campaigns. One, you're a uh, USMC soldier. Or you, is that yeah? That's what they're called. I think the the Colonial Marines. Uh, the other one, you are a predator, and the third, you are a xenomorph. Well, technically, you start as like a, a chest burster, and then a xenomorph. Something else about this film is I've never realized that the chest bursters have little arms. I thought that was just a thing they made up in fucking um, Spaceballs. I've never seen the chestbursters' little tiny hands before on the models. Oh, fuck. <laughs> on the models in the film, on the toys, on the merchandise. Never noticed them. They always just look like a little worm. Uh, it, it makes sense <laughs> that I think about it that they would start off like that with the limbs intact. Uh, similar to a tadpole or something. Maybe not a tadpole. How do tadpoles work? <laughs> uh, uh, like Shin Godzilla. My favorite Godzilla film where it evolves over the course of that movie. Shin Godzilla, now that I think about it, is the xenomorph of Godzilla's, isn't he? It, rather. But um, the scene of her blasting the xenomorphs and how their heads like burst and explode into chunks. There's a very similar visual in that Alien vs. Predator game. Um, <laughs> and now, like I said, I, as if you couldn't tell again, I love this movie. I highly recommend checking it out if you're a fan of the Aliens franchise and you haven't seen it yet and you just sat through my spoiler-heavy discussion of it. This wasn't even a review, really. It's just stuff I liked. <laughs> but something happened to me after I saw this picture. And I was sitting in the theater hall outside the theater waiting to get picked up by my wife who refused to go see the film so i was waiting her to come back and get me and as i was sitting there i watched as two 60 something year olds a man and a woman a couple husband and wife possibly looked like they're on their way to a nice Friday night stroll through the mall. They walked past me, and I expected them to leave at first, but then I saw they had a giant bag of popcorn in hand and a big soda cup in the other. And where did they go? They walked right in to the theater that was showing Borderlands. <laughs> what are they doing? I want to know what's up with those two. What are these two old 60-somethings doing going to see Borderlands? <laughs> and that is the end of this week's episode of the Comic Stick Podcast. Let me know what your thoughts are on Alien Romulus 2024, the hit film, hopefully. I really hope that Fede Alvarez gets to work more on Alien films. I think there's a... A uh, show that's coming out, right? That's set in the Aliens universe. So, it, it, for the most part, it seems like Aliens fans are going to be eaten pretty well for the next couple of years. <laughs> With their little little mouth tongues. Uh, which I like that we saw a bit more of and how they're used in this film, I think. But, let me know what you thought in the comments below. What do you think that old couple was doing going to see Borderlands? <laughs> Uh, what are your thoughts on the upcoming comics that I discussed? Uh, Crow's Nest. Are you going to go see The Crow? If you do, let me know what it's like in the comments below, because I don't really want to go watch it. <laughs> um, what, are your, what do you expect Chick-fil-A to have on their streaming service? Thoughts on the CGC comics? Uh, Zack Snyder's Twilight of the Gods? And Sony losing their Spider-Man guys? And all the movie trailers. Are you going to go see Mufasa? As always, let me know in the comments below all your thoughts on what I discussed this week, and let me know on any topics or suggestions or movies I should review on the show. Check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash Smokies videos, where you can get access to my comics, early videos, when available, original art, um, movie commentaries, audio commentaries, stuff like that. Check out my Etsy, blaketwild.etsy.com, where I will soon have the Custodians Issues 1 and 2 available on sale online, so you can purchase them, buy them through there. Every purchase from my Etsy shop, because I do have all five issues of Destructoboy available, come with a free head sketch of any character of your choosing. I will also be at Tucson Comic Con August 30th to September 1st, 2024 in Tucson, Arizona. Come by, say hi, booth AA183. 
And um, I'm also going to be at YumaCon in October in Yuma, Arizona. So if you're in the uh, southwestern side of Arizona or Southern California, come say hi as well. And that concludes this week's episode. I will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>